Good day, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a minute. I wanted to uh, go over a few logistical items. The session is being recorded and will be made available on our website. So for that reason, and for due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, your lines have been muted. So for comments or resources that you'd like to share with the group, there is the chat. However, for questions, we will be using the Q&A feature within Zoom. We'd like to encourage you to use that. So feel free to start typing in your questions throughout as they come to mind. Typically our speakers will attempt to answer them when they are not presenting. And if we have time, we will select a handful of questions that we will try to cover at the end of today's seminar. Um, so we'll always include the full transcript of the Q&A with the session materials as they are posted. So thank you again for joining us. Um, my name is Terry Martin with the NAVSIG Foundation. I also have Charlotte Abel with me, who's going to be helping me monitor the chat. Uh, so with that, I would like to go ahead and get us started um, and turn it over to Chris Vaughn, the Geospatial Information Officer with FEMA, who really had the vision behind the series to get us kicked off both on the topic of earthquakes and also on the vision of the EMGO Forum moving forward. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Chris. Great, hey, just doing an audio check, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Great, well, thanks and welcome everybody uh, to today's discussion. I, I need to make it brief. I am currently activated for Tropical Storm Zeta. So we are preparing for landfall in what is yet a, another round robin of, of impacts to the Gulf Coast. And um, things are going very smooth. So, you know, just a quick update on that. Things are going really sm smooth. And I think it's, 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 well, quite frankly, it's due to our preparedness activities. We've, we've now been through, well, I think, eight landfalling hurricanes now, five of which are kind of in the same general area. So um, this, this, uh, this area is well known. Uh, to Terry's point about why the EM Geo Forum, first of all, we're very grateful that you're taking the time out of your busy day to be with us today, but it's, it's all in the name of preparedness. You know, earthquakes arguably are, are a, a maximum of a maximum event. If you go all the way back to numerous national level exercises, 2011 comes to mind, 2017 comes to mind with New Madrid. It's really viewed as these unfathomable complex things that um, that could that could really take a you know a hit to the national response strategy of, of how we deal with very complex issues so you, you can't over prepare for things like this but you know through efforts like this training we're building capacity we're building capability and and, and we'll be able to, to handle a, a new type of, uh, event so um, I'm excited for you guys to hear the latest and greatest of what we're aware of across the disaster modeling operational analysis space. I'm very grateful to the NAPSIG team for their hard work on this. Um, we do not want to do this in a vacuum. Um, obviously, we're viewing it from our lens of the world, our perspective, that being a headquarters strategic level agency like FEMA. But the scientists in the room, um, you know, we, we, we want to make sure that we're tracking the latest greatest science. Once again, I'm, I'm activated for Zeta. A lot, of, a lot of conversations running around. Sorry about that, guys. But, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're hearing from all the available brains that are out there, a lot of, a lot of good capabilities that are out there that we want to make sure that we're capturing uh, so that we're not discovering it just in time. So I'll stop blabbling, turn it back over to the NAPSIC team. But once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really do value your feedback on, on how to make these trainings better, but more important, what, what content we should be uh, uh, promulgating for the good of the order. So thank you so much. Back to you, Terry. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you uh, pulling double duty and juggling both a, a response and our forearm today. Um, and for the vision for, for this, um, which is really to enable the community and equip decision makers and first responders and the technical staff that support them. Um, so thank you all. With that, I would like to move into our presentation portion and introduce you to our esteemed panelists. Um, so with us today, we're really lucky. We have Madeline Jones, uh, Matt Walshans, Jesse Rizal, and John Haloub. Uh, they all work together to support FEMA's national and regional response, as well as provide models and analysis and information products to support states and locals, both during preparedness activities and planning, as well as in response. So I'm going to introduce them uh, as their portions come up today. So with that, um, 
And for anyone who's maybe not as familiar with our organization, I'd like to just briefly talk about who we are. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety and GIS practitioners alike, representing local, state, tribal, county, municipal levels. And we formed about 15 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. Our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders and leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working towards building a more resilient nation. So what you see here is how uh, a representation of how we work towards that vision. A large part of what we do really culminates in delivering a session like today. So sharing and encouraging the consistent use of best practices that we have developed through our work with mission partners like FEMA and states and locals across the country to develop standards and test them through exercises and sometimes real world disasters. And we continue to refine those based on stakeholder feedback and lessons learned and then provide education and training resources that are free to the community and or uh, through tech, tech transfer and often through partnerships like what we're doing today with FEMA, ultimately with the goal to build capacity of the community. So of course you can visit our site for more information and get access to those resources. Um, our presenters are also going to be sharing exactly where to go following this seminar for specific content and tools that can support your shop to prepare for, mitigate against, respond to, and recover from earthquakes. So now I'd like to show you um, uh, who your fellow attendees are. So we had um, actually over 260 registrants as of yesterday, and we were able to geocode 251 of those, which is pretty good. Uh, we have a nice cross section across, uh, of the country and good representation from the EM community, fire and search and rescue. And if we do a quick review by jurisdiction, um, it looks like we have more than half from local, state, and federal government, followed by the private sector and NGOs. And it's always interesting to see who's joining us, and it's also helpful for our presenters to know we who we have uh, with us. Next, I would just like to um, share with you what we hope you'll leave with today following the webinar. So you'll get to hear from, FEMA's, uh, from FEMA on their geospatial response to the Puerto Rico earthquake. Learn about resources that your shop can leverage from preparedness through recovery for an earthquake and gain some insights on um, what others have done and are doing to prepare. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Today we have Madeline Jones joining us. She is a geophysical data scientist with New Light Technologies out of Washington, DC. She currently leads New Light Technologies uh, team in support of FEMA's Response Geospatial Office, where she develops hazard models and mapping tools to aid FEMA with predicting disaster impacts in near real time. Thanks so much for being with us today. Maddie, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Madeline Jones, like Terry said. Um, I am a geophysical data scientist at New Light Technologies, and I currently lead our team that supports FEMA's Response Geospatial Office. My background is in geophysics and I studied induced seismicity in grad school. And part of my current role is to develop models that predict damage to structures following major earthquakes. So I have some experience working with the data and resources that I'm going to be discussing today. And my presentation is probably more of a primer for everyone. There will be some more in-depth presentations that you'll hear from my colleagues um, and other panelists in just a little bit. Um, so let me see if I can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to go through the earthquake products timeline and I'm basing my conversation here on the Modi earthquake annex. And if you're unfamiliar, the MODI stands for Modeling and Data Inventory, which was an effort led by FEMA and the Modeling and Data Working Group. The purpose of the MODI was to identify and characterize models that are used to support operational decision-making in the context of emergency management. 
Um, and through the Modi, there were a lot of resources and documentation produced surrounding data and products for different disaster types. Um, 2015 was quite a while ago, so the Modi for earthquakes is quite outdated. So as I go through the timeline and I find something that has since been modernized or turned into a dashboard or something, I will sort of interject that newer, more modern, updated resource when um, applicable. I'm also going to talk about FEMA's Earthquake Incident Journal and some other resources for earthquakes at the end. There's a lot of links throughout my presentation, so feel free to take screenshots or throw those links in the chat as we go. Um, the goal here is just to do quick overview. Um, so blown up picture of the Modi earthquake annex timeline. You can think of it as like the earthquake happening at zero hours and then we move vertically down through these different rows of data that's available five minutes after the earthquake up to 20 minutes, 12 hours after the earthquake all the way to like 72, three days um, and beyond. So before I go any farther, I think it is important to reiterate that USGS um, has an earthquake hazards program and USGS is the authoritative agency for monitoring and reporting on earthquakes, assessing impacts and hazards and conducting targeted research on cause and effect of earthquakes. And they have a whole bunch of products and great documentation on the different products and data services that they have available some standard ones that most people are probably familiar with are ShakeMap and the web services of the real feeds uh, or the real by real time feed of the ShakeMap data set. Um, Did you feel it, which is sort of like a crowdsourced ShakeMap um, ShakeCast, which is um, consequence modeling through the USGS, um, as well as some more recent products such as aftershock forecast, ground failure estimates, and impact estimation through the HAZIS program at FEMA including financial loss and fatalities and other great things there. I would encourage you to check out all the documentation on these different products and I will touch on some of them throughout the earthquake timeline. So after an earthquake happens, the first um, notification system that you can sort of sign up or subscribe to is called the USGS Earthquake Notification Service or ENS. Um, it'll send you a notification email or text message when an earthquake happens. Um, and you can customize the system to only deliver messages for a certain geographic area um, between a certain time period um, or of a certain magnitude or greater. Um, and then uh, within five to 20 minutes following the event, um, USGS provides a shake map for the event. Shake map is a spatial representation provided in near real time of the ground motion and shaking intensity. There are various formats that the data is available in um, from you can go to the website and download a zip, a zip folder with shape files and layer symbology for MMI, PGA, PGV. You can also pull in the data as a real time feed or web service, which is what FEMA is doing with the Earthquake Incident Journal. Um, shake map data are used by federal, state, and local organizations, both public and private, for post earthquake response and recovery purposes as well as for preparedness exercises and disaster planning because you can pull shake map data from archived or historic events. So it's really the primary authoritative spatial representation of the earthquake hazard. USGS also provides some preliminary exposure estimates through their product called Pager. And they have fairly recently developed a collaboration with FEMA's Hazus program to bring the public to Pager. And I'm happy to let Jesse speak to that in the next presentation, but I have included a link at the bottom of the page here if you wanna go check it out and learn some more. Um, and then the Modi kind of jumps to the availability of power outage information. This information has historically been made available through Eagle Eye, which is the DOD's near real-time energy sector monitoring system. And it is secure and it requires account approval. And I think it might also require FEMA network access, but. I wanted to mention the creation of FEMA's Lifeline dashboards because there is a dashboard for power and energy that incorporates the Eagle Eye data feed as one of the primary data sources. And in two slides further, I'll get into the Lifeline dashboards a little bit more. But for now, I just wanted to show that there is um, additional um, updated or more modern resources pulling in these authoritative data feeds that the Modi mentioned. Um, so now we're kind of moving up to like 12 hours following the earthquake and the next couple of resources here available within um, those 12 hours following an earthquake are related to health and medical and tracking evacuations. 
as well as planning for food, water, and shelter. So these are some links to some um, great primary resources. There are also some more, um, I guess, ESRI or online tools dashboards that we've made available that um, provide some of this primary data or other comparable information in near real time um, that I will speak to right now. So the lifeline dashboards, or these dashboards are built around FEMA's community lifeline construct. And the goal is to display the status of each lifeline and they are designed to work with all types of disasters and data types. And I mentioned previously that the energy and power lifeline dashboard pulls in authoritative data service related to power outage from Eagle Eye. And they all work with the authoritative static data through high field. There are also dashboards for health and medical and food, water and shelter, which pull in from many of the resources I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, but all of them have been developed to show in as near real time as possible, um, either using dynamic and or static data, um, an operational status for each lifeline at the national level. So I would direct you to FEMA's hub site to learn more and get access to those dashboards. A majority of them are public facing. Um, and then one or two of them, I believe, are internal because the data sources they pull from, such as Eagle Eye, are non-public data sets. Um, Moving along. So the next couple of slides are, we're now highlighting products from the 12 and plus hours and beyond portion of the timeline after an earthquake. Um, and this next one here is the Hazus results viewer. So um, the Hazus program will produce the authoritative run of record for that earthquake event. That data is typically shared publicly and with FEMA's response geospatial office, uh, we will then produce that information into a web service and make it available through the Hazus results viewer which is one of the story maps inside of the earthquake incident journal. And I'll speak to that um, shortly. And I'm not gonna get too much into the hazardous results because I know Jesse is going to be speaking um, shortly. Um, and then here are some urban search and rescue or field data collection resources that Paul Doherty on my team at FEMA has shared with me. Um, this is certainly not my specialty field, but there are some really useful resources out there in terms of field ops templates and sandbox environments and deployment resources that can be accessed at the links on this slide. And then in the spirit of USAR and prioritizing areas for your response operations, I wanted to just touch on um, the post dashboard. So FEMA's response geospatial office runs post for major disaster events and post stands for prioritizing operations support tool. And the post output is provided as a web service in the post dashboard, which you can find on, again, on FEMA's hub site. Um, this is a predictive output displaying areas of greatest risk at the USNG grid cell level for any given event based on social vulnerability, population, and hazard data. And the output could be used for um, something like prioritizing areas to deploy field teams to, or prioritizing imagery acquisitions, or other things like that where you need to sort of break down and prioritize um, smaller subsets out of a really large impact area. Um, debris, so there are some resources and documentation from the Army Corps that can aid with debris estimation. Um, in the past, we have used MB software to detect debris using um, high resolution multispectral imagery. This is an example from Hurricane Michael using NOAA imagery, um, but any products like this that are generated from our team would be shared out as web services that you could access through FEMA's hub site. Um, FCC DEERS, DEERS stands for Disaster Information Reporting System. Um, once DEERS is activated, meaning the disaster is significant enough that they sort of turn on their activation, they will start sending um, our team at FEMA cell tower outage data. And we are taking that information and producing it updating a feature service that then populates the communications lifeline dashboard. So this data um, is now sort of converted into another near real-time feed that you can um, view through FEMA's hub site. Um, and then one more sort of um, mo update on like a modern take on something that the Modi referenced was FEMA's logistics supply chain management system and deployment tracking system to support response logistics. Within the Earthquake Incident Journal web app gallery, there is an earthquake logistics dashboard. And this is where we're taking that real-time feed of the shake map data produced by the USGS 
and enriching it with demographics and population and social vulnerability information, and then taking FEMA's planning factors and applying that to the impacted population and estimating the number of cots or water bottles or um, meals per day that need to be sent in order to aid the response to that event. So that can be viewed as those data sets come available through that real-time feed from USGS. Um, and then moving into the 72 hours plus section of the timeline, there are a number of ongoing response activities such as um, updates to the ShakeMap data set. So the USGS sometimes will, um, for a really significant event, will relocate the epicenter of the earthquake and produce a new shake map. Um, and with those updates come new iterations to the impact estimates, possibly new houses runs, and then some updates to the, the, the data products that have been created from those shake maps. Um, and then continued recovery efforts, such as preliminary damage assessments, which can be field surveyed or based on imagery or modeled. So all of that stuff kind of comes in two, three plus days following the disaster. And then a couple things here that were not in the Modi timeline that I thought were really important to reference. Um, first, the earthquake incident journal. Um, this is a story map that provides relevant spatial decision-making support for FEMA leadership. It's also public facing. So it's a view into the federal information that's available to the public. So this is pulling all of those authoritative data feeds and trying to provide some context to what's going on with the event and what could be needed from um, FEMA leadership in terms of decision support. And that includes the um, hazardous results viewer, the FEMA logistics dashboard, there's a FEMA population impacts dashboard in there, and then any ancillary products that we create, including the building exposure, that would be this dashboard, and I'll talk to that in just a second, would all be available through that earthquake incident journal. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is um, NASA's Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis Team, or ARIA. Um, they are using synthetic aperture radar or SAR data um, and processing it to produce damage proxy maps, which use change, the uh, change in coherence between before and after SAR scenes as a proxy to finding damage structures. Um, and they're producing this data automatically after a significant enough earthquake to warrant that they sort of kick off their system. Um, they're also taking ground deformation measurements from space using INSAR, which is based on the change in phase from the before and after SAR scenes, and they have fully automated the data processing and production of these standard products. Um, both the damage proxy maps and the interferograms are publicly made available through the NASA Disasters GIS portal, and I would also direct you to those websites to get more information on those two products. And then lastly, um, earthquake building exposure. Um, in the past, for significant earthquakes, we have taken the high impact area and intersected it with building outlines and then spatially joined parcel land use data onto those building outlines um, and then shared that. We got permission to share that data publicly for 30 days following the disaster and to build a web dashboard like this that sort of groups the buildings into their different types of um, categories. So just good for situational awareness in terms of what types of buildings are impacted. And then this is also made available through the um, FEMA Earthquake Incident Journal. And lastly, a couple more resources here. Um, you can always check out FEMA's hub site earthquake page, which will link to, I think, all of these resources and more. Um, that's what the little video showing is here, or is showing here. Um, and then the USGS Earthquake Hazards page, if you want to learn more from the primary source of a lot of these authoritative data sets and, and feeds. And then I would also include here ShakeOut if you're looking for additional resources for earthquake preparedness um, and information on the world's largest earthquake drill. And that's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, you really provided a good overview for what is happening and becoming available um, and when during an earthquake. So thank you so much for that. I am going to take over control momentarily and introduce our next speaker, um, who, as Maddie said, is going to go into some more detail. We have Jesse Rizal, um, who is the program manager for FEMA's Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program. 
Um, FEMA's uh, NHRAP team serves as subject matter experts in the development of risk assessment tools, data sets, and methodological guidance for supporting emergency management and risk reduction decision making. So thank you, Jesse, so much for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk today about as is earthquake modeling, um, both from a response perspective and also some steady state work that we do. Um, these two snapshots here um, on the left is an example of the, of the spatial format of um, some USGS shake map data that, that Maddie referenced. And then also on the right um, is a screenshot from one of the older analyses from the Wasatch Front earthquake modeling uh, that I, I believe John Holland's gonna talk about later in this presentation, but um, it shows uh, some of the building level uh, analysis that we can do with HAZA so we can actually model the probability of damage for different damage states at the building level if you've got really robust building inventory data to bring in. Um, so, but, but first, let me move the slide forward here, great. So first, uh, a little bit of, this is a high level background of HAZUS. Um, HAZUS is FEMA's um, standardized loss estimation tool. It's been around for over 20 years. It, it started after Loma Prieta and uh, Northridge, those two uh, major earthquake events and uh, Congress tasked FEMA with coming up with a standardized loss estimation methodology uh, to try to serve as a collecting place for a variety of these uh, loss estimation methodologies, formulas, uh, inventory concepts, and hazard data inputs um, into one tool. Um, we started with an earthquake model. We added in hurricane wind and storm surge and riverine and coastal flooding uh, back in uh, 2005. And then our latest hazard addition, uh, we added the hazard tsunami model um, back in 2017. And that does uh, near and distant source tsunami. So distant source tsunamis would give you the ability to model um, just um, tsunami, tsunami impacts to, to a community. Uh, near source uh, is, uh, for instance, uh, an earthquake um, in the Puget Sound that would trigger a tsunami that would cause both combined earthquake and tsunami damages. So you can do both of those as well. So combined damages for those near source events. Um, and on the horizon, we, we have been working with uh, NIST uh, to develop a tornado model um, in the future. So more to come there. Um, yeah, and here's some of the timeline and how we have developed this over time. Um, adding a new hazard to the HAZUS tool, it's, it's no small task. So first, um, you, it takes a significant amount of methodology development with a peer reviewed uh, group of our uh, subject matter experts that are hazard specific. Um, then uh, we go to you know, some actual proof of concepts and then actual software implementation at the end. So we, we approach this slowly and carefully to make sure that we uh, move forward in, in a, a detail oriented manner to make sure that what we're producing is not only credible, but also open and transparent um, so that um, you can see how everything is uh, calculated within the model um, as you run it. So uh, all of our technical documentation, uh, software, everything is freely available on fema.gov slash has this, and I'll, I'll post a link in the chat after my presentation. So one example of how we use has this in steady state for earthquake modeling in addition to response is the uh, FEMA USGS, what's called P3366, has this estimated annualized earthquake losses study. This is where we worked uh, uh, in conjunction with uh, our team, the USGS, and uh, John Holub out in FEMA Region 8 to model uh, annualized earthquake losses for every state in the United States. And um, that included uh, baseline probabilistic earthquake ground motions provided by the USGS. And um, so it, it's, it's used to measure relative risk across the country for earthquakes um, based on probability. And it's used quite a bit in the NEHRP grant process, but also is, is a great way to measure relative risk across the nation um, 
for earthquakes, which are infrequent, but can be highly impactful. So it's definitely something good to plan around. Um, so there's a link there to the publication. And um, we um, are also working with the USGS on um, a US infrastructure annualized losses study to look at the National Bridge Inventory that was originally planned for early 2019, but is a little bit delayed. And um, But we're still working on that and hoping to release that in the near future. So for the NHREP earthquake information timeline, this is a, a small subset of activities that's going on between the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program and the USGS NEIC within that broader timeline that, that Maddie presented on. Um, so uh, at, at uh, event onset, the earthquake occurs and we transition through initial shake, you know, point source shake maps, pager products, which I'll show in just a second. Um, and then those shake maps and pagers are refined over time. And uh, within about an hour, we uh, have um, a refined shake map with uh, additional uh, finite fault information and uh, other calibrations to the shake map, including sometimes did you feel it reports that, that Matty referenced. Um, so within about two to three hours, we have an actual hazardous run for that event based on the shake map data that's available at that time. Um, for, for our FEMA counterparts, we coordinate very closely with Chris's team at ORR and also our point of contacts in the FEMA regions to make sure that everyone knows what we're, what we're doing and that we're coordinating these runs. And one very important step that we implement by doing the runs here uh, from the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program and the Hazards Program uh, perspective is we share our initial results with those earthquake experts at the USGS National Earthquake Information Center. Um, for QA, QC before those are shared out. It takes a little more time, but um, it, it's important for, for what we do. Um, and then uh, we share them through our, our FEMA network and then it ultimately it goes into the incident journal that, that, that Maddie showed earlier for, for the public. This is a snapshot of the uh, earthquake event page for the Ridgecrest earthquake. And it just shows the scale of the amount of information that the USGS pulls for um, each earthquake event that, that, that they create. Um, the shake map box to the, in the upper right is where all of our data inputs for HAZUS um, come from. We have within the HAZUS model, a GeoJSON feed. So when you open HAZUS and create an earthquake study area, and you go to select your scenario, it automatically pings that shake map feed to show you events near or within the uh, area of study you've defined in HAZUS. So um, data interoperability from authoritative hazard data providers is, is a big priority for us now. So, so we um, leverage all the great work that they do, and then we bring that over to the risk assessment component um, that we focus on with HAZUS. So the loss estimation and then um, creation of uh, actionable results. So here's a snapshot that shows some, uh, an example of USGS one pager, which is the original USGS pager product. And then the new uh, FEMA uh, combined FEMA USGS two pager product. So um, USGS pager product has been around a long time. It, um, is globally available for um, any earthquake uh, globally. And it breaks down comprehensive earthquake impacts into a color-coded system of uh, green, yellow, orange, or red. Um, an event all the way up to red is a, considered a catastrophic event um, that could trigger an international response need. Whereas a green event is um, a relatively low impact event um, so based on the buildings and the people and the construction practices within the earthquake uh, ground, high, high ground motion areas, um, it's, it's not as big of a response event um, um, as, as other events. And this is really important. Um, FEMA and the response community as a whole, prior to products like this and uh, prior to incorporating more and more GIS modeling into what we do, 
used to trigger response assets strictly based off of event location and event magnitude, but the impact from those can, can change drastically. If there's a, a 7.0 way up in the, in the woods, in the mountains where there are no buildings, that doesn't necessarily warrant a major response um, effort. But if there's a 5.4, for instance, right under Los Angeles, that could. So that's where this modeling is very important. So on the left is a traditional pager product that's been around for a long time. And then the FEMA USGS two pager product that incorporates has its outputs, but brings it into a reporting framework in conjunction with the pager product. Um, with HAZIS, you can, you can pull more uh, detailed uh, loss estimates than, than with the, the pager product, which is more of a macro scale uh, level of analysis. And it shows the, uh, if you look at the graphic on the right, the HAZIS estimate arrow shows where that aligns with losses from the pager product. So it's, it's a way to rapidly compare two really thorough, thoroughly vetted and, and tested models. Um, to give us even more and more certainty as to the um, confidence in our results, but also more and more accuracy for for the United States. Uh, for the United States, um, the USGS two pager product is only available in the United States because um, of the significant inputs that has its needs to generate this level of detail. Um, whereas the uh, USGS one pager product is is available globally. And this uh, graphic here shows a lot of the types of outputs that you get from Hazus, um, as well as um, a way for us to try to communicate as much actionable information as possible to the response community, um, all in one snapshot. So our intent with these products is um, for you to be able to open a PDF on your phone, wherever you're at, and glean as much information as you can. So. That has its building tagging estimates as a way we crosswalk our damage outputs to um, uh, rapid uh, building inspection categories that are commonly used post earthquake for inspections. Uh, as well, we've got direct economic loss impacts, which can be really helpful in assessing the, the scale of an event um, for disaster declarations, as well as shelter needs, um, injuries. Uh, that may require hospitalization, earthquake debris, and um, and um, uh, the earthquake debris is also broken down into truckloads of debris. Um, so this isn't all the outputs from Hazus, but this is uh, the most uh, readily available and uh, rapidly actionable um, information that we can pull together into this product here. So for online access, um, uh, Maddie referenced the uh, Earthquake Incident Journal. Um, a lot of our major events end up there. There's a snapshot of the magnitude 6.4 in Puerto Rico. Um, but we're also building um, what's called the Hazus Loss Library uh, that we're hoping to release next year. Um, this is a snapshot of the prototype, what it'll look like. But we're creating an online catalog of all of the best available um, has us lost scenarios, real event data, and a, a conglomerate of the best available studies that we have collected throughout the community for earthquake, flood, hurricane, and tsunami. So that these can be used for mitigation plans, catastrophic planning efforts, um, disaster response, whatever, whatever your need. So anything that goes up here will be publicly available and will be vetted by the Hazus program for credibility, accuracy, and well-documented so that um, you don't have to search for all this stuff. We'll have it readily available for my area. I'm looking at floods, what's, what's been done before, um, so that you've got those resources to start when uh, looking at uh, risk assessment or planning in your community. Um, lastly, um, here's my contact information. That was a very Fast uh, background on Hazus and Hazus earthquake applications. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program or myself at the two emails um, on the screen. Also, I will post uh, some some links in the chat. Um, if you're interested in signing up for the Hazus newsletter, um, any of our webinars, or any news about new 
has as tools. We have both a desktop software platform and open source tools that are constantly being improved. Um, I'll post some links there and you can sign up to our Gov, de Gov delivery list and receive our updates. Thanks everyone. Awesome, thanks so much for the update on HAZUS and the NRAT, NHRAP program. So we've had both um, Maddie and folks from the HAZUS team present on previous webinars and trainings. And there's always new enhancements to existing tools and new resources developed. So I appreciate you both kind of keeping us updated on what is available and giving us a good overview on those resources, as well as how you've turned some really complex models into actionable information products to decision makers. So thank you both again. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to move on to our next presenters who will share how these various models have been used in practice. So we have with us both Matt Walshantz and Jimmy Rodriguez. Uh, Matt is a geospatial information unit lead for FEMA's National Incident Management Assistance Blue Team. He has been a FEMA field geospatial unit lead for responses to the Kilauea volcano eruption, Hurricanes Florence and Michael in 2018, Hurricane Dorian in 19, and the Puerto Rico earthquakes in 2020. He also served as a geospatial analyst during the Hurricane Maria response in Puerto Rico in 2017. And Jimmy is the unit GIS unit lead for FEMA Region 2's Caribbean Area Office in Puerto Rico. And he's been doing GIS professionally for 16 years, 10 of them with FEMA. And he's been an active during uh, response operations as GIS specialist, manager, and unit lead during tropical system events, earthquakes, pandemics, and full-scale exercises. As part of his duties, he works directly with GIS support, the U.S. Virgin Islands that are also part of FEMA Region 2. With that, I will turn it over to you, Matt. double check that you're unmuted. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> had, the, uh, had to find the mute button. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Welshans. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, uh, GIS unit lead for National IMAP Blue. Uh, I worked with uh, Jimmy Rodriguez and uh, quite a few of the uh, staff down in Puerto Rico uh, during the uh, earthquakes of 2019 and 2020. Um, so real, real uh, so we're going to talk to you about um, the earthquake swarm from down there, discuss how we used GIS uh, in response to the earthquake and highlight some best practices from our after action. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jimmy and he's gonna talk to us about uh, what happened. Hi everyone, like Matt said, uh, Jimmy Rodriguez here, uh, local from Puerto Rico, uh, been working with FEMA for some time now. Uh, what happened? So uh, since 1918, we hadn't had any significant events in Puerto Rico, uh, seismic wise. Uh, that was a 7.1 that generated a tsunami. Uh, and then fast forward 2019, uh, around the holiday season, uh, on December 28th, we had a 4.7 that was quite felt uh, all throughout the island. And then on January 6, 2020, uh, it's a uh, like a holiday in Puerto Rico, uh, it's Epiphany or Three Kings Day, we had a more significant one of 5.8, uh, which was uh, mostly felt throughout the island. And at that time we had an emergency declaration. Uh, then uh, started getting communication with the RCC or the Regional uh, Response Coordination Center, as well as the headquarters office for FEMA. And then on January 7, the day afterwards, we had the biggest one, which was a 6.4, uh, we had some damage mostly in the southwestern part of Puerto Rico. As you can see on the slide, uh, those are a lot of the aftershocks that happened during and after uh, January. Uh, to this day, we still have activity, uh, not as significant, but we have had uh, aftershocks uh, in the 1900 count, which is pretty amazing. And 14 of those have been uh, of five point magnitude or higher. Uh, so that's some of the background that we've had uh, in the aftershocks. May 2nd, we had a 5.4. July 3rd, we had a 5.3. And then in August, we had a 4.8. Uh, so some of the damages were initially in January, but some of those aftershocks kept affecting infrastructure that was already damaged or, or affected initially. Here is another screenshot. Uh, we had one, uh, one fatality uh, attributed to the earthquake directly. 
and there were about 8,000 uh, temporarily displaced. Uh, Matt will talk more about that, uh, about the sheltering uh, process and how it was set up. And some of the financial losses were estimated to be over $3 billion in Puerto Rico. Yeah, so um, we use GIS in generally uh, four phases in the field, um, initial situation awareness, uh, sheltering, uh, building inspections, and infrastructure uh, restoration. Um, of note, we also worked with um, our urban search and rescue teams. Um, however, that was mainly handled at the territorial level. Um, FEMA did help with uh, some of the national response. Um, so for initial situation awareness, uh, as our team deployed out, uh, we ran a uh, data extraction tool against the uh, USGS shake map. And this provided us with some initial information that we could use for mission uh, scoping and for asset management. Um, this is some of the results of that. Um, this was done probably in the first uh, hour or two after the earthquake uh, first occurred. Um, what you're seeing uh, in the center is the uh, pager um, alerts for the earthquake. So the initial was an orange alert and then we had several uh, in the yellow and green. Um, those are uh, aftershocks. Um, after we get the initial situation awareness, um, we get um, computer modeling, which is done through the HAZIS team. Um, Maddie uh, also talked about using the, uh, the POST, which is uh, the prioritizing operations tool. And we use that to um, set priority areas for satellite data collection. Um, it's also used by our operations staff to determine areas to dispatch teams um, to assess survivor needs. Um, the other side of this, um, we use crowdsourced information for that initial ground truth. So voluntary GIS groups and uh, NAPSIG help give us that key ground truth information to highlight um, areas of concern so that we can um, action on those as needed as well. Yeah, sorry. Um, due to high winds, we um, weren't able to fly our normal CAP mission, uh, Civil Air Patrol mission. Uh, for several days. Um, so instead, what we did was we mission assigned uh, those staff to collect ground level uh, imagery instead of waiting for the optimal flight uh, conditions. Um, utilizing Survey123, uh, we were able to capture damaged uh, building images and some initial comments. Um, we also had FEMA staff going out into the field and they used a similar form to collect information. Um, given this effort, we collected over 200 images, which were used for preliminary damage assessments, and that helped us speed up some of the uh, designations for individual and public assistance. Um, later on in the mission, um, we uh, had to deal with sheltering. Um, with the uh, number of aftershocks, uh, residents were fleeing from their homes and going into either traditional sheltering or non-traditional sheltering. Um, we had uh, people that were building tent villages in some of the neighborhoods. Um, as the uh, traditional sheltering shut down, um, Puerto Rico National Guard established larger uh, survivor base camps. And uh, these were uh, basically in large stadiums across the damaged uh, areas. So uh, we helped with uh, tracking some of that progress. Um, for the sheltering mission, um, we had to work with um, our mass care and crowdsourcing units to help locate some of these non-traditional shelters. So our team worked with, um, with uh, CEDAR, the uh, Crowd Emergency Disaster Response Digital Corps, and um, they helped us track some of the clusters where um, this non-traditional sheltering was occurring. So we cross-referenced that data with uh, Puerto Rico's mass care reports and social media and news articles. Um, so we were able to map out some initial um, sites so that we can give those to our mass care teams to assess um, survivor needs and assistance. Um, we also had to uh, come up with some alternate um, base camps. Uh, we had heavy rains in the area and a lot of the base camps were in uh, flood areas. So FEMA used criteria shown on this slide um, to uh, determine where some of these alternate sites could be set up. Um, in general, we were looking for large areas, preferably uh, sports complexes that were outside of flood and tsunami zones, 
and away from steep slopes and uh, outside the areas of highest shaking. Um, importantly, the alternate sites needed to be uh, within a reasonable drive of the disaster area, generally under an hour away from those disaster zones. So our regional and headquarters teams, um, they produced a map for us of uh, six alternate sites. Um, ultimately, these weren't used, but they were great to have as backup sites in case there was flooding or um, evacuations were needed. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jimmy, who's going to talk to us about uh, building uh, damage assessments. Yeah, so for building assessments, we had a couple of teams that were coming into Puerto Rico. Uh, we had uh, Cal OES and we had New York City buildings teams. Uh, those were the main ones that were doing assessments for structures and, and damages. Uh, they were working basically like two days after the big earthquakes or the day after. And most of what they were collecting was done with survey one, two, three. Uh, while we had to work with them and to some degree with some of the Commonwealth agencies of Puerto Rico, they were integrating what they were collecting and they were providing us a, an Excel spreadsheet, which we will take into a map as shown on the slide. And that kind of shows you the buildings that were good to go, greens. So we had the green, yellow, and red system. Red was like completely destroyed or, or not uh, able to be used uh, in those buildings. So for that, that was combined by the Disaster Survivor Assistance Teams, uh, which is DSA within FEMA. What they were doing is they were having a visual in their mobile apps or uh, devices like cell phones and iPads. They will be able to see this building damage assessments and they will know where there was a lot of damage or there was no damage. So they could prioritize areas of doing their field work. So what you're seeing there is, is what the building damage assessment teams from California, New York, we're mostly doing and that was represented and it was able to give uh, some eyes on the field to the FEMA staff that was going there fairly quickly after the earthquakes. Is it back to you, Matt? Yeah, I think he's muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so um, some best practices that we learned, um, region headquarters and uh, field staff, we synced up really quickly uh, after the earthquake happened. Um, and we were in contact with each other constantly beyond our daily sync call. So uh, that was one of our major wins. Um, we utilized um, USGS information to build scenarios uh, for crisis, ac crisis, crisis action planning. And uh, we were able to use GIS to do some data extraction and some more spatial analysis. Um, so that was pretty key for us down in the field. Um, two things that we said uh, we needed to work on a little bit more, um, working on uh, getting that base infrastructure information that can be used with uh, model information. Uh, such as HAZUS. Um, some of our base level information was a little outdated, so um, that we're working on right now. And we also talked about um, during Blue Skies working with stakeholders to integrate and script information uh, such as power outage and water outage information so they weren't um, manually uh, done for us. Um, so that is a quick summary of uh, what we did out in the field. Um, just a real quick plug again for the FEMA uh, Geospatial Resource Center. Um, we contribute a lot of field level data as well to this and um, we rely on state, local, territorial and tribal information to contribute. So uh, please go online and hit that contribute button so that your information can also be shared with our uh, federal partners. Um, thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much to you, Matt and Jamie. Hard to believe that was almost uh, a year ago. Um, and I appreciate hearing how you use the Shake Map and Post Tool crowdsourcing and mobile data collection. I think that was really helpful to see all of that in practice. And I know we're getting close on time. So what I want to do is stop sharing and turn it over to our final presenter. Um, and John, go ahead and feel free to start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. So we have John, who is uh, the FEMA Region 8 Geospatial Coordinator. 
Asia. And uh, he's been with FEMA for five years in GIS and previously with uh, Region 8 IMAT. John has been working in GIS for 15 years, most of that time in forestry and wildland fire in Northwest Montana. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Terry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of blaze through some of these, especially since uh, Jesse covered uh, a lot of the Hazus intro. Uh, normally when I do the Hazus intro, I like to show the YouTube videos. Uh, the Hazus team has made some really good videos if you go to YouTube and search Hazus. In addition to an intro, they have some good tutorials on how to get started and other information as well. Uh, so uh, some things I like to stress when talking about Hazus uh, down here at the bottom. Hazus is an estimation tool, not a deterministic tool. It has a planning tool, not an engineering tool. Has this assesses population needs related to emergency management. Uh, so it's a really good tool to get an idea of what's gonna happen for emergency managers and operational planners, but it might not be the best, um, the best software to give you uh, what's gonna happen in an earthquake at, a, at a, maybe a structure level or a street level, something like that. Uh, that's just a graphic of the new uh, Hazus pager over there on the right. Uh, these are the modeling capabilities of Hazus. Uh, again, Jesse covered these pretty well and this info's up, so I'll, I'll go through this pretty quick. Uh, the earthquake is the most robust model. It's been around the longest. And you can see from the bullets, it, it gives you a pretty good idea of uh, what can be expected to happen in, uh, in your scenario. Uh, one thing that Hazus uh, doesn't do, it's just too difficult to model, is model for aftershocks. And uh, in the scenario we're talking about here, the Wasatch scenario, they would almost certainly be aftershocks, there will be aftershocks. And this is a this is a draft product from the USGS and you can see that there's a 48% uh, chance of a magnitude six and a 29% chance of magnitude seven aftershock of this scenario. I'd like to show this graphic just uh, so you can keep in mind how interconnected everything is. Um, and uh, it does no modeling can account for how complicated uh, you know, reality is and how interconnected some of these lifeline systems are. And disrupted lifelines will impede stabilization across all other lifelines. Uh, the scenario history, uh, why we're so concerned about the Wasatch, um, basically every 350 years or uh, so that the segment goes off or part of the segment on the Wasatch Fault does. And the um, the bottom line is uh, there's a 43% chance of a magnitude 7 point or 6.75 in the next 50 years. And a lot of people simplify that 50% chance in the next 50 years that this could occur. Here are some of the hazards um, outputs that we got for our run. I won't go through all of them, but uh, the big ones, and this, uh, I think this is last year's iteration. So it's, uh, it's not quite current, but it's close, but 3000 fatalities we can estimate from hazards. It affects in some way 80% of the population of Utah, whether that's uh, displaced households or power outages, water outages. Um, economic impacts would be widespread across the region. This is uh, our region eight. Um, and uh, this is a kind of our timeline for what we've been working on. And uh, unfortunately, like all things, COVID has put a, a big, um, line and we're way behind schedule and what we actually complete will probably look very different, but it was an ambitious schedule to put together the national level exercise and it's still in flux about what that's gonna look like. Um, and this uh, messy slide here is uh, we held these, um, these workshops with all the stakeholders. Uh, that's the picture there. That's the Utah EOC in Salt Lake City there. And what we did is we took all the hazardous results and we put them into kind of a big data viewer. And it's not really for public consumption. It's mostly so stakeholders could go in and see how their piece was uh, affected by the impacts of the earthquake and how it performed over time. And uh, these were very valuable because once you get different people in the room, they start to uh, understand how they're gonna be able to respond. Uh, we heard from a lot of different stakeholders, well, our building is okay, but we're not gonna be able to perform if we don't have power, or we might have power, but we don't have water, therefore we can't perform. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the search and rescue component. Um, you can see uh, these are the most impacted census tracts, uh, red tag buildings completely destroyed. And right 
down here around Salt Lake City, where the most of the unreinforced masonry buildings are, is where uh, you know over half to 66% at the census tract level buildings were expected to be completely destroyed. And as you get out into the suburbs where the newer buildings with better building codes are, that goes down a little bit. Uh, same thing here. This one is uh, the casualties and injuries. And again, you see uh, most of the casualties are right in that downtown Salt Lake City area where there not only are unreinforced masonry buildings, but also multi-story unreinforced masonry buildings. If you think about the historic downtown down there, there's a lot of three, five story uh, brick buildings that are potentially not reinforced. So that's gonna be the bulk of the search and rescue, at least at the beginning stages. And for this scenario, Salt Lake County uh, contains over 90% of all casualties and injuries. Now, uh, this is just an example of uh, what our data viewer looked like when we were sharing with our stakeholders. And uh, right after the uh, you know, loss of life, uh, the uh, transportation lifeline impacts were huge because you can't really save lives if, you're, if you can't get your uh, search and rescue personnel out to where they're impacted. And uh, the Hazus was actually showing pretty good functionality on the roads, but the uh, overpass bridges, um, much lower performance, somewhere down in the 4% expected on day one. So you might be able to drive around the roads, drive around damaged areas, but you'll get to these overpasses that have likely failed. So this is, a, this is an example where we took the hazards results and we ran it by the local DOT and DOD experts. And they came up with this, um, this more realistic in their mind of what would actually happen on the ground. So this is using hazards results to come up as a lens to come up with a more realistic uh, what's gonna be down and what's, what their plan was. You can see, uh, I don't have a legend on here, I'm sorry, but this black is expected to have zero functionality they call this the bucket right down downtown and they're not expecting that to be functional at all. But you can see some of these um, routes here, they're expecting to come online towards green as we approach day 30. And they have a plan um, to, to get around the city as uh, the earthquake response and recovery progresses. Uh, another big one was the, uh, the power. Uh, actually has this was showing the power is coming back online fairly quickly. You can see around day seven, we're at minimum 65% functionality. And by day 30, it's up to 90%. But again, that's likely dependent on some of the other lifelines. Uh, they're gonna need communication to get around. They're gonna need transportation roads to be open to get the crews out. Uh, this one is, uh, has this models, uh, households without water over time and at the county level. And you can see that households uh, are showing to come back online much slower according to has a set at day 90, there's still almost a quarter million households without power because there's gonna be so many damaged water mains that are gonna need dug up and repaired. It's just a much slower lifeline to get back at the to a stabilized level. And using that has this information, we were able to complete this lifeline Emory, uh, impact summary. And it's basically what we're expecting to see across all the different lifelines. Uh, for this scenario, I won't go through all these, but using this, we could give it to our uh, stakeholders and operational planners, and they could start to generate plans. You don't have to strain your eyes to look at these too hard. These are just examples of uh, the plans that we're working on. So the hazardous modeling really does a good job communicating that risk to stakeholders and the local knowledge and stakeholder collaboration uh, that we had in the workshops is really key to understanding the problem and the potential solutions. We got all these uh, different stakeholders in the room and just having them talk together and talk through the problem uh, and create contacts really uh, improved our output. And from these discussions, we're attempting to build quality operational plans for our, uh, our deliberate plan update, which should be done this year, next year, uh, next year with COVID and everything. So if you're thinking about doing uh, a hazard study for your area, I would, uh, Suggest and Jesse covered and Madeline, basically everybody's covered these, uh, your resources here, but uh, you can go to your area and you can check out the uh, USGS scenario catalog. And they very likely, if you're in an area with a fault, they have a scenario already uh, designed by experts for you. And you can run, you can bring that directly into Hazus and run it with the Hazus standard inventory. And uh, you can also check the FEMA 366 
uh, to check your, it has uh, modeling for the uh, all states, all 50 states and all counties and all 50 states. And you might not be able to read these, but there's about a dozen or so different, different layers available, uh, annualized loss, annualized loss ratios, annualized loss per capita. Uh, what we saw mostly is our biggest numbers are uh, predictably uh, in California, but there's uh, plenty in along other faults throughout the US as well. Uh, so what are our next steps? Uh, more hazardous runs, uh, that'll continue until our final update of the Wasatch plan. And uh, we still have to create a, a geo-enabled plan, which will be uh, an interactive online format. Um, you know, the technology is changing so fast, we'll probably use something like Experience Builder. Um, but we want to communicate the risk to all stakeholders, also the public, and uh, detail our response plan as well and have that data set available for a uh, public download. Um, other than that, continue to work state, local, private sector, federal, and other partners. But that's, uh, that's about what we're doing here in Region 8 for the Wasatch. And other than that, questions or comments? And uh, turn it back over to you, Terry. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. OK, 